Beware how you neglect secret prayer and a study of God's word. These are your weapons against him who is striving to hinder your progress heavenward. The first neglect of prayer and Bible study makes easier the second neglect. The first resistance to the Spirit's pleading prepares the way for the second resistance. Thus the heart is prepared and the conscience seared. Prayer is the breath of the soul. It is the secret of spiritual power. No other means of grace can be substituted and the health of the soul be preserved. Prayer brings the heart into immediate contact with the wellspring of life and strengthens the sinew and muscle of the religious experience. Neglect the exercise of prayer, or engage in prayer spasmodically, now and then, as seems convenient, and you lose your hold on God. The spiritual faculties lose their vitality, the religious experience lacks health and vigor. So I wanted to read that for anyone who is feeling weak spiritually or discouraged the secret strength the secret of spiritual power is prayer private prayer so our subject for today i decided i wanted to preach on the fourth commandment and the fourth commandment is unique very unique in the in that it's the only one out of the ten that you have to show still exists. Everyone takes for granted the other nine are moral, but there is an alarming amount of people who suppose that the fourth commandment isn't really equated with the other nine or shouldn't be equated in it amongst the other nine. In fact, people perhaps say that maybe it was a mistake that it would have been in there, seeing it was a Mosaic law. It shouldn't have been given actually by God Himself. The moral law and the Mosaic law are two separate and distinct things. Morality governs mankind, doesn't matter what race you are, morality is morality. But everyone puts the fourth one into the Jewish basket, into some cultural setting. And so because of the thought upon the Sabbath compared to the other nine, it makes it unique. Let us read Exodus 20 and verse 8 and 9. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 and 9. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. In this fourth commandment are two precepts here shown. Firstly, that there is a day of resting from your work and showing that the remaining days needs to be occupied with work. And so the fourth commandment isn't just about the day of the Sabbath, but it is also showing what you do on all the other days. Many people have said, oh, if, you're, if, you, if you keep the Sabbath, then you're a one-day Christian. Does the fourth commandment deal with just one day? No, it actually deals with seven days. That's the whole week. So you can't keep the Sabbath unless you occupy yourself for six days. That's part of the commandment. Six days thou shalt labor. Thou shalt labor for six days. But on the seventh, it's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Our society doesn't like labor too much and perhaps that's another reason why this commandment isn't popular. Is the fourth commandment 
a moral commandment. Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49, probably when we talk about morality or immorality, the most gross immorality um, exercises has often been um, put into the city of Sodom. You know, Sodom is equated with immorality, isn't it? Let us read Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 16 and verse 49. We read, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her. So when we talk about the hotbed of immorality, what were the three things that were here, these root problems? Pride, lots of food to eat and plenty of spare time. Does being idle cause immoral actions? Of course it does. We can see, I mean, if, you've, if you're identified with the story of, of Lot in Sodom, I mean, it was a terrible thing what these people in Sodom were trying to do to the, to the guests that came in to stay with, with, with Lot. And what was the root of that? Idleness. Were they working six days? No, they had spare time. If you work hard all day long and then you come at the end of the day to, to retire and, and do your basic house duties and things and, and have some prayer and meditation, the day's gone. What else are you going to do? You're tired because you've been working physically. I read a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, 156, paragraph 2. There is nothing more desired among men than riches and leisure. And yet these gave birth to the sins that brought the destruction upon the cities of the plain. He's talking of Sodom and Gomorrah. Their useless, idle life made them a prey to Satan's temptations and they defaced the image of God and became satanic rather than divine. Idleness is the greatest curse that can fall upon man. Idleness is the greatest curse that can fall upon man. So tell me, is the fourth commandment that says, six days thou shalt labor, is that something that is applicable today? It's so important. So important. Idleness is the greatest curse that can fall upon man. For vice and crime follow in its train. It enfeebles the mind, perverts the understanding and debases the soul. Satan lies in ambush ready to destroy those who are unguarded, whose leisure gives him opportunity to insinuate himself under some attractive disguise He is never more successful, Satan is never more successful than when he comes to men in their idle hours. There's another statement in Mind, Character and Personality where it says that there are thoughts and feelings aroused and suggested by Satan that annoy even the best of men. So Satan works upon us with thoughts and feelings. This statement says he is never more successful than when he comes to men in their idle hours. In other words, idle hours causes more thoughts and feelings than you can know what to do with. Now I'm not saying that when you work there is no temptation left, but there is a great reducing of these things. He's not as successful He still can be successful in in people that are busy, but he is most successful when he comes in their idle hours. So you can see here that 
that idleness, what flows in its train? Vice and immorality. And so you'll actually find that in the fourth commandment is housed two things. In the fourth commandment is housed the source of morality, which is time with God, spending a, a, a day where it's between you and God, your mind is to be uplifted to Him in praise, in worship, in, in not being distracted by what you've got to do, but just a whole day of doing God's pleasures. So you'll find that the fourth commandment holds the source of morality and it also reveals the source of immorality. And so this fourth commandment is, is unique in that if we do not keep the fourth commandment, we will find that we cannot be moral at all. It's the key to all the other commandments. And that's just the one that people think shouldn't be in there. How convenient. It's good for the devil if he doesn't want people to follow in God's ways. And so let us turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58 and verse 12 to 14. Isaiah 58 verse, verses 12 to 14. And it says, And they that shall be of thee, shall build up the old waste places. They, thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, and shalt honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thy own pleasures, nor speaking thine own, thy own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and to feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. What is the Sabbath all about? Not doing thine own pleasure, on my day, but calling the Sabbath a delight. How many people cannot do what they want to do and be happy about that? People can't. It, it's contrary to human nature. So this commandment really strikes at the base of what humanity actually love. Do we love pleasure or God? Because the Sabbath is going to determine that. Because if I can't do my pleasure... But I, I, and I love my pleasure more than God, then I will despise this particular day. And so it says in 2 Timothy 3, that perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their own selves. And then it goes on to say, that they shall be, they shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness from, from such turn away. So it's not that we don't love God, it's just we love pleasure more than God, is the worldly mindset. There's God and there's my pleasure. Most people work for the weekend. It's a common saying, well, I'm working for the weekend. The reason why people work is so they can live to have pleasure. And I've talked to people and they said, well, if I didn't have to work, I wouldn't. I just wouldn't work. Because they don't actually enjoy work, they enjoy pleasure. But then if you think of the fourth commandment, six days thou shalt labour, and you're working for pleasure, but then on the seventh day when there is meant to be this spare day, and you can't do your pleasure, then well, how, how are you going to deal with that? You've got to come up with another day. So let's have a two-day weekend. And let's have... A day which is for God, yes. And let's have a day for pleasure. Fun in the sun. Let's call it Sunday. And so these two days, these two times, people have come to use both days as days of idleness. 
Whereas the scripture declares, six days thou shalt labour. Now please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we have to go out and get a paying job for six days a week, but we need to be busy six days a week. And the Bible does tell us that in Jesus' ministry, there came a time where you rest a while. So to have a break from your constant labour, there is nothing wrong with having a break from that and having a rest for a little while. But when it comes to our average, what we are to be doing, we need to be working, occupied with activity six days a week. That's what the scripture says. Six days thou shalt do all thy labour. And on the seventh is a day not to do your pleasure, but to do, to delight yourself in God. Now, if you delight, if your pleasure is in God and you find that there is pleasure with God, then you'll find it a very happy day. And if you actually find work pleasurable, then you'll always enjoy your days. But the mentality that has crept into this society in which we live, that work is just a drag and I need some other outlet, is not really scriptural. In fact, when Adam and Eve were placed into the garden, their work was actually a joy. Something they liked to do and they did it. And you know, the wearisomeness or getting tired of work, while ever we can be physically tired from work, but the, the actual stress of work doesn't come from physical labour, it comes from a mental outlook. How do you look at it? Do you look at what you do as what you enjoy doing? Do you enjoy doing it? Or is it a drag? It depends how you look at it. And if you don't really like doing it, then most of your life will be miserable. Whereas if you, see, if you see work as actually a gift from God, that we can labour with our hands and we can, be, uh, we can build character in doing this, then it will be a blessing. So the question is, is the fourth commandment moral or not? It's extremely moral. In fact, it's the source of morality and the neglect of the fourth commandment is the source of immorality. It's where it all springs from. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8 says it very powerfully in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul speaking, to, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. What does he have to say in regards to not working? 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. It says... But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Worse than an infidel. Let's turn to another scripture in Hebrews chapter 4. And we will see, I mean the commandment says it so clearly, but... People say that that commandment doesn't exist anymore. So then, do we need to work six days anymore? If the claim is true. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Let us labour therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, or a keeping of the Sabbath, as the margin says. For he that is entered into his rest, he author has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us, let us labour, therefore, to enter into that rest. And so it is imperative that the six days of labour come before the rest. It is by necessity that the seventh day is the Sabbath, not the first day. You don't rest and then work, you work and then rest. And so by necessity it is needful for the seventh day to be the day of rest and in that you cannot have that rest unless you have previously worked. In other words, to break the news to you very plainly and that is, 
If we don't occupy ourselves for six days in useful, diligent labour, we cannot keep the Sabbath. You can't keep it. And so, if I can't keep the Sabbath, then I couldn't be Seventh-day Adventist in reality. And so the useful labour, useful work is moral. And I'd like to read a statement from Third Testimonies. Testimonies to Church, Volume 3, page 395. The Master has a work for each to do. None can be idle. None can be careless and selfish and yet perfect Christian character. Can I perfect a Christian character when I'm idle? It's impossible. You can't do it. You can't do it. Another statement from First Testimonies, page 395. I have been shown that much sin has resulted from idleness. Active labor, sorry, active hands and minds do not find time to heed every temptation which the enemy suggests. But idle hands and brains are all ready for Satan to control. The, the mind, when not properly occupied, dwells upon improper things. Parents should teach their children that idleness is sin. Idleness is sin. You see that it's not just, there's a lot of people that can work with their hands. They're working with their hands and their brains are going all sorts of places. The labor, active hands and minds. In other words, our minds need to, be, need to be harnessed into what we're actually doing, not wandering around thinking what the neighbors are doing. This is part of labor. It's not just physically doing something. You know, you can do one of those jobs which is, we call no-brainer jobs. You don't have to think too hard and just move your mung out, do your work. Well, God is saying you've got to work with your brain too. The brain can't be idle. And that's the question. Are our brains idle? Just like butterflies going anywhere and everywhere. Parents should teach their children that idleness is sin. It says up a little bit further, mothers should take their daughters with them into the kitchen and patiently educate them. Their constitution will be better for such labor. Their muscles will gain tone and strength and their meditations will be more healthy and elevated at the close of the day. They may be weary, but how sweet is rest after, proper, after a proper amount of labor. Sleep, nature's sleep restore, uh, sorry, sleep, nature's sweet restorer invigorates the weary body and prepares it for the next day's duty. Do not intimate to your children that, there is, that it is no matter whether they labor or not. Teach them that their help is needed and their time is of value and that you depend on their labor. Our society has often thought, you know, child labor, children shouldn't be working. Now, there is an abuse of that in the third world countries where children are just used as machines to do work for cheap people and people make lots of money. That is definitely wrong. But the idea that children just play and do whatever they like while ever their children and when they get up over school then they get a job and get taught how to do things is just as criminal children need to be taught to work in the house around the home and to be part of the family firm this is so important for their mental development and their physical development and so once again, is the fourth commandment moral or immoral? It's moral. Mind, character and personality. Volume 2. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's actually um, messages to young people. 
messages to young people. 213 paragraph 1, it says, It was God's purpose to alleviate by toil the evil brought into the world by man's disobedience. By toil, the temptations of Satan might be made ineffectual. And the tide of evil stayed. And though attended with anxiety, weariness and pain, labor is still a source of happiness and development and a safeguard against temptation. Its discipline places check on self-indulgence and promotes industry, purity and firmness. Thus, it becomes a part of God's great plan for our recovery from the fall. So can you see that actually this working, the six days of labor, which the fourth commandment shows, is a part of the plan of redemption? You can't do without it. You can't say, I'm a Christian, stop your job and be on the dole. You can't do it. You wouldn't be recovered. It continues to say down the page a little bit more, one of the surest safeguards against evil is useful occupation. While idleness is one of the greatest curses for vice and crime and poverty follow in its wake, those who are always busy, who go cheerfully about their daily tasks, are the useful members of society. In the faithful discharge of various duties that lie in their pathway, they make their lives a blessing to, other, to themselves and to others. Diligent labor keeps them from many of the snares of him who finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. The path of toil appointed to the dwellers on earth may be hard and wearisome, but it is honored by the footprints of the Redeemer. And he is safe who follows in this sacred way. By precept and example, Christ has dignified useful labor. From his earliest years, he lived a life of toil. The greater part of his earthly life was spent in patient work in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. In the garb of a common laborer, the Lord of life trod the streets of the little town in which he lived, going to and returning from his humble toil. And ministering angels attended him as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers unrecognized and unhonored. So here is the Lord of glory, our great exemplar, the person who we worship and admire. He comes to earth to show us what a Christian life really is. And out of his 30 years, how many were spent in the home toiling? <laughs> Out of his 33 years, 30 of them were, were quiet in the home, obviously growing as a baby, but then from it, f being taught how to toil in that home right up until the age of 30. Now, that's, that stark contrast with the mentality of today. Because here is a person who went around unnoticed and unhonored. You would have been, if, if, the, if this was our mindset, we would have been tempted. We're wasting our time here. We're meant to be the savior of the world and no one knows about me yet. I need to make a big noise in society and, and blow my trumpet to let everyone know I'm here. Yet he shows that Christians are to work and live quietly. That's what he shows. And then when he came into his ministry, you know, he did some, he would do an act and he goes, don't tell anyone, keep it quiet. But of course they didn't, they couldn't keep it quiet, so they didn't. So he, he was popular, not by him pursuing popularity or trying to make a big hoo-ha, but by simply doing God's will that he had for him, he did create a big stir, not his pursuing of, I have to create a big stir here. I'm just going about and doing what I'm doing. And if he hadn't had the years of training beforehand, it wouldn't have been a successful experience. He learnt by the things which he suffered. We read in that, in that text in the Sabbath school this morning. 
And so judicious labor is a helpful tonic for the human race. It makes the feeble strong, the poor rich, the wretched happy. Satan lies in ambush, ready to destroy those whose leisure gives him opportunity to reproach them under some attractive disguise. He is never more successful than when he comes to men in their idle hours. And then in the same book, Messages to Young People, page 148. Because work isn't just about working for work's sake, it's about character training. I address you, young men, be faithful, put your heart, put heart into your work. Imitate none who are slothful and who give divided service. Actions often repeated form habits and habits form character. Patiently perform the little duties of life. So long as you undervalue the importance of faithfulness in little duties, your character building will be unsatisfactory. In the sight of omnipotence, every duty is important. The Lord hath said, He that is faithful in that which is least is also, or, uh, is faithful also in much. In the life of a true Christian, there are no non-essentials. Many who claim to be Christians are working at cross-purposes with God. Many are waiting for some great work to be brought to them. Daily they lose opportunities for showing their faithfulness to God. Daily they fail of discharging with wholeheartedness the little duties of life, which seem to them uninteresting. While waiting for some great work in which they may exercise their supposedly great talents and thus satisfy their ambitious longings. Sorry, and what? And while waiting for some great work in which they may exercise their supposedly great talents and thus satisfy their ambition, lo, ambitious longings, their life passes away. More than wasted. My dear young friends, do the work that lies nearest at hand. Turn your attention to some humble line of effort within your reach. Put mind and heart into the doing of this work. Force your thoughts to act intelligently on the things that you can do at home. Thus you'll be fitting yourself for greater usefulness. Remember that King Hezekiah, that of King Hezekiah it is written, in every work that he began, he did it with all his heart and prospered. The ability to fix the thoughts on the work in hand is a great blessing. How many of us start something and then psh, uh, we don't finish it? Our mind starts wandering, not so interested in that anymore. And so we work according to our mind and then our mind travels off and then we just travel off with our mind. Instead of pulling my mind and keeping it until a job is done. And it is a good thing for children to, when they start something, to be thoroughly encouraged to finish it. And the satisfaction of finishing it will, will be a reward in itself. But if there's a lot of undone things, then it causes a destabling in the mind. And so it has been, and children that haven't learned that when they're young, come up and, and into adulthood and do the same thing. Start something or talk about something and it goes so far and then it just doesn't get done anymore. The ability to fix the thought on the work at hand is a great blessing. Can you see that it says, uh, the, the text in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind. To gird it up is to belt it up and brace it and to, to pull it in. Harness it. Harness our mind. So you can see that the, the Christian work is in putting our mind and our hands to do something to the glory of God. Whether it be at home or whether it be in His service. God-fearing youth should strive to discharge their duties with thoughtful consideration, keeping the thoughts in the right channel 
and doing their best. They should recognise their present duties and fulfil them without allowing their mind to wander. This kind of mental discipline will be helpful and beneficial throughout life. Those who learn to put thought into everything they undertake, however small the work may appear, will be of use in this world. doesn't matter how small. The, the, the thing that you do is, is only a means in which to discipline your mind. And so if you look at that thing and say, oh, I don't need to do it, you don't discipline your mind on it, you actually lose the, the grand benefit that that little thing actually had for you. I don't know about you, but there comes a time in, in the Christian walk where things seem to, to, get, to get stale. The experience is that someone may come to the Lord, and they learn all these amazing truths and all these things just buzz the mind and it's like, wow, this is amazing. Different paradigm shifts and different perspectives to look at the world and, and it really occupies the mind. Then after a little time, once you've pretty much grasped all the grand themes, maybe not in all the detail, but you've, you've got a large chunk of what the whole plan is all about, and then you hear it again, and then you go, yeah, okay, I've heard that, I've heard that, oh. And then the mind starts starting to wander. And you think, well, what, what is it in Christianity that has to keep happening? Do I have to keep finding some new fascinating thing to excite my brain, some new philosophy, some new little angle that that just goes, wow, I never saw that before. And, 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 and is that the ongoing walk of a Christian? Or is it taking what we know and actually coming to life and doing our work by harnessing our mind and walking in a very consistent way after that? And this is exactly what the Bible says. If we turn... If we turn our Bibles to uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter three, sorry, First Peter, one verse thirteen. First Peter, sorry, I read out the wrong one. First Peter chapter one and verse thirteen. First Peter one. Verse 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As you have received him, so walk ye in him. There comes an experience where we need to just start concentrating on harnessing my mind now. And that means that Christianity may may seem a little dull for a little while, but if we gird up the lawns of our mind and hope until the end for the grace that will be given to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ, this is the ongoing experience of Christianity. What we're doing at home. How we're engaging our mind activity. Now let's go, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians Second Thessalonians chapter three and verse ten. And here the apostle actually if you read the context of this, he's talking of the the um the apostolic church and he's saying if any in if anyone doesn't walk orderly, don't keep company with him. And this is talking of, if you do a study on what it means to not keep company with someone, it means that they aren't a member of the church. It doesn't mean that you just avoid them and never talk to them. It's, that goes contrary to many other scripture, scriptural statements. But don't keep company being part of the ch same church. So you can see that even the removal of church membership can hinge upon idleness. And here Paul says that we have to give an example. We'll just start in verse 8. Uh, sorry, verse 7. 
For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we have for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. We wrought with labour and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So he was the apostle. He had all the right to just uh, solicit in his ministry to get help from the from and eat food at from house to house and wherever he went and didn't have to supply his his own needs. He had power to do that. But he says, I've given you an example. And so I didn't do that. I didn't go to your house and just eat your food for nothing. I labored and I purchased everything that sustained me. Why? So I can show you what you're meant to do as a Christian. This is what you're meant to do as a Christian. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. It's a commandment of the apostle. You don't work, you don't eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all. And what's the result of, doing, of not working? But are busybodies. Here is a major source of church problems. Now, people can work and still be busybodies. But it's harder to work and be a busybody. But if you are um, idle, then to, to get into people's affairs and to really sort of uh, interfere with people's lives is the result, is a major result of idleness. And just for, for understanding, if we just flip over, keep your finger there, but for 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15. Do you know what the Bible equates being a busybody with? 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15. Being a busybody is a real curse to a church. It, it's something that needs to be avoided at all costs. And it says, talking of persecution, uh, let's just read verse 14. Um, to, for context, if, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Murder thief, evildoer, and a busybody. That's pretty hard. The, the mentality to pry into people's lives is just as wicked as murder and thieving. To pry into other people's matters. The Bible says that we are to um, to labor and to learn how to live quietly. So let us go back to Thessalonians, chap 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we read in verse 10, uh, 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, walk, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So to have a engage in, in some ministry of what you do, whether you're in your work, you can still do well to other people. And so we can see here, according to this scripture, that the apostle 
is using his position as as an authority in the church saying i have commanded you by example to work but there are some in the in the church that aren't working and as a result of that become busybodies and he says to those people he exhorts them that the lord would command them to learn how to live quietly in other words mind your own business and to eat your own bread that's christianity live quietly did jesus do that yes or no he walked through the streets unnoticed unhonored he just minded his own business and sure he did we- he was not weary and well doing if he saw someone hungry he helped them and he had his his ministry all the way through his life really but he was not in idleness and just going around being a social problem and so let us read another statement in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and the apostle Paul's quite strong on this point 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11 And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may, ha- that, and that ye may have lack of nothing. It's a powerful statement. To walk honestly. And this word, if you look at where it says study to be quiet in the margin it says aspire aspire to lead a quiet life it's an aspiration as a christian to aspire to study how to live in a way of not um of not being a busybody and doing your own business minding your own business yeah, because the margin says to do your own business or in the margin it says to mind your own business. That you may walk honestly. Ellen White writes of this in... She says here in... Um, um, what, is, what is TT? Okay, well, it's TT. I don't know what the, exactly that stands for. Testimony treasures. Okay, thank you. From okay, page 140, paragraph one. It says one of the strongest evidences of true conversion is love to God and man. Concerning love of the brethren, the apostle wrote, "You have need to have. You have no need to have any." one write to you for you yourselves have been taught by god to love one another aspire to live quietly to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we charged you so that you may so that you may command the respect of outsiders and be dependent on nobody one of the strongest evidences of conversion To live peaceably with all men. Now the truth has its power to make us stir. But as a people, we are to be quiet, loving people. We are not to be rioters, as the Bible says. Rioters and people that are activists. That's not our work. Our work is to uplift the truth. To keep the commands of God, which means to be busy working. Six days thou shalt labour. And do all thy work. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That entails minding my own business and being happy in that. And as this takes place, there will be far less temptations. Far less. Because Satan will not use the... He uses... He makes men idle. Then once they're idle, he makes them busybodies and tattlers. And then you get social dilemmas in the church and then the church falls over and it's all wrecked because people haven't been occupied properly. And so if, you were, if you're interested to know, how do I continue as a Christian? How do I continue to develop in Christianity? Our continual development comes in girding up the loins of our mind. And how does that happen? But by not 
working and letting my mind wander, but pulling my mind into what I'm actually doing and bringing the Lord into what I'm doing. It's not, people have, have thought, well, you've got to have a prayer life, so you've got to, you've got to be, you know, have your eyes up into the stars while you're trying to work and you'd be so inefficient that your boss would fire you if you were like that. You know, just being airy head. If we've got work to do, let's do our work and let's know that God is with us watching us. And do it with all our might as serving God Himself. And as we do that, I know for sure God's blessing will come. Why? Because I know that not working is the greatest curse. And if you can get rid of the greatest curse, you'll bring in one of the greatest blessings. So it's my prayer that we can understand that the fourth commandment is moral. And that we can labor to enter into that rest and be true Sabbath keepers and live quiet lives is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.